Welcome, welcome, welcome to my favorite night of the week. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be here with you all. Yeah, just really rejoicing and hearing everybody talking and connecting. It's super special um, that we, yeah, get to do that here together and that we're here with the shared purpose on this shared path in order to wake up for the sake of all beings. Because man, do they need it? <laughs> And do we need it, right? Yeah. So this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. If it's your first time or your manyth time, it's a volunteer-run Dharma Center, which is such a special, unique thing in this day and age that everyone who comes to this place is held in the generosity of those who support this place. And it's really sweet. It's a it's a very different way to experience our day-to-day -day life, and yet it is the very kind of foundation of how these Dharma teachings have made themselves into an unbroken lineage for thousands of years, right? Of course, there are ways to earn income and uh, have a kind of commercial approach to the Dharma, and that can also work. But this offering here where everyone is welcomed without you know, any kind of transactional necessity is really beautiful and really special in a way to create community of shared values and ideas. And I'm Eve for those I haven't met. And tonight we are going to continue with uh, this beautiful book, which I like, I really recommend, really recommend. I definitely am going to diverge from the book and I often do. And we're going to circle around it. But I find this book to be almost like an apothecary. Like you can really heal yourself with it. And um, it's short. I mean, come on, that's great. Like literally you could sit down and read the whole thing in probably three hours. Uh, I don't know if there's an audio book, but I imagine it would be, there is. And it's probably what, like two hours of audio, something? A little more, yeah. I mean, so it's just a really wonderful source of wisdom. But we're going to take a little bit of diversion from this tonight. And my hope is we are going to do two practices together. And the first practice, for those who have our mighty wristbands, uh, we did a New Year's Eve or New Year's resolution intention setting here of really practicing the four immeasurables every day. Who's been on that? <laughs> yeah, all right. a little bit, you know, just a little bit every day. And I do want to make sure we're bringing those immeasurable practices here. So we have, we've done loving kindness. We did, especially that night, the loving kindness practice. And tonight we're going to do compassion and a really specific kind of compassion, a compassion for the suffering that we create in addition to the suffering in our life. So what's sometimes called the additional mental suffering. Sounds good, right? And then as a dessert, we're gonna work with water and retrieving the essence or natural essence of water. So in this book, what Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche is offering is a way to connect with these different aspects of the natural world based in the Mon tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. So drawing from this more indigenous approach to how to bring meditative practices into our life for healing. And you really feel the kind of difference of this approach from maybe more um, traditional Tibetan Buddhism that isn't coming from this tradition in this kind of focus on these natural essences. And so before we start talking about compassion, I'm curious if anyone did their homework and had a date with earth last. Yes, okay. Can I hear a little bit about people? So for those who weren't here, last week we really focused on finding that fundamental energy of ground. And to do so, you know, really, what is that like? What can we imagine it like? And we brought forth an image of ourself in a place where we feel grounded, where we feel supported, we feel that connection. But Wangyal Rinpoche's invitation to us is to go out and make a date right? Whether it's in the park or the yard. And, you know, I thought it was so interesting, our conversation last week of the earth may not always be the safest place for everyone, right? That maybe you've had an incident with a, a snake or a difficult creature, or maybe being out makes you feel exposed. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a really remote, isolated 
a place where you're completely free of other people. It can absolutely be a backyard or a park as we have in the city. So I'd love to hear one or two folks just share about what it was like to make the date with Earth. Would you be willing to share? Um, I started taking my lunch at the beach. Whoa! So it's uh, yeah. Do you want, do you want to... <laughs> so we're just gonna give this so our friends at home can hear. Yeah. So I started taking my lunch um, on the beach and um, just hearing the waves and the people interacting. Like they bring their dogs and it's like there's no um, worries of everyday life. Mm -hmm. It's just you're you're there and. And where I work at is pretty stressful. Hmm. So when I come back, I feel like, okay, I, I could do another four hours of this. Wow. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Anybody else? Saw some hands over here. I got a I got a couple of spots in West Marin that I go to pretty regularly. And um I go there. I have to be judicious with how much time I spend out in the woods because I'll spend like way too much time in the woods and I have an overabundance of earth mm. like too much mm. and I'm I, I I you know I I do all the things that that we talked about last week when there's a, an overabundance of earth but I I wanted to check it out and see how how I feel out in that environment with that awareness now. And I just sort of, okay, yeah, this is really comfortable. I could do this like all the time, but it's sort of indulgent. And I and I have I'm I'm you know I'm water's another one that I've got a pretty good balance of. But air and fire are the ones that mm. I'm lacking. Yeah. So that was that was what was interesting about doing Earth for me. Yeah. This week. Yeah. Was, yeah. And did you sit actually do a meditation on Earth? Yeah. Earth? Yeah. I've got a, a spot out um out on this one trail that that opens up onto this nice warm spot, and I often sit there. Yeah. And that gives me a little bit of fire because it, yeah, when it's a sunny day. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. That's good too. Thank you so much. Lots of sky. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I see right next to you. Thank you. <clears throat> we went to Nicasio last week in the, with Coco. And we sat after walking a while. And then suddenly, uh, flames came out from a little bit afar, mm. and lots of uh, dust, and and we didn't go close to it, but it was like, oh my God, please stop! It, yeah. it was so horrible to yeah. think that fire can yes. be so good and so bad. Yes, and. Uh, so but it, yeah. it was very, very, very pleasurable. Yeah. And Coco ran a lot, even mm -hmm. though now he's blind. No. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, right. And so there is, you know, this quality we talked about of Earth last week is that kind of the Earth will carry us no matter what we're bringing to it, whether we feel fear or joy, sorrow. And yet, you know, in the true reality of, this time we're living in our climate, the earth is actually struggling, you know, and to feel the the fragility or the the risk or danger too. It's another element. And Mongel Rinpoche does talk about how these practices can support our ongoing relationship and relationality with the natural world, not just a subject object, but a sense of deep care too. And there's a lot of pain and worry for our world. Yeah. And just as a reminder for folks, when when we feel uh, balanced in earth, it's grounded, stable, connected, able to focus, strong, steady, and a joy of being. And we have too much dull, uh, unable to move, stubborn, depressed, withdrawn, fixed, oversleeping. 
when you have too little ungrounded, unstable, dissatisfied, I think that one's interesting, disconnected, spacey, agitated, ever searching and restless. So that's, you know, some of the ways we start to start using this as the apothecary it can be of like, what do I need more of? And so I really appreciate Jimmy saying, oh yeah, you know, I actually, I have enough and I don't need more. And then we're sharing like, now I can go back to my work and bring this with me. It's really beautiful. Um, so yeah, so we will move towards water later, but I, I wanted us to, you know, part of this book and also I'd say every great Dharma teaching that I've ever encountered and read is this insistence, if not invitation, that we really learn to sit with and be with the parts of ourselves we try to avoid and ignore. And there's actually <clears throat> no way forward on the path if we aren't willing to look at and sit with and be with the parts of ourselves we are habitually ignoring and avoiding. And all of us in this room are in some ways fortunate because things in our life have shown us that we need help right? And just distraction or avoidance aren't doing it. So we end up in a crazy place like this with these teachings, right? As a different way and a different path. And yet just knowing that there are these difficult aspects of our life or these difficult parts, um, maybe of our past that we're still working with, that doesn't mean we've developed a lot of comfort in being with them. Anyone agree with that? And it's funny, you know, because this is true at the very micro and then the macro. And we can see both in our meditation. In the micro, it's like the minute we feel discomfort, we're like, oh, I don't know. You know, we can like see how we're always trying to move around. And, you know, there's that really, that desire to not be with what's hard. But then as we start to pay even closer attention to our practice and especially when we're not practicing, like when we have a resistance, like a feeling as though I don't really want to sit. I don't want to sit. I don't want to do this. You know, that resistance. Usually a part of that resistance is there's something I'm, I'm not wanting to feel. I don't know if folks have encountered in their life people who, um, who don't meditate and maybe they find out you meditate and they're like, whoa, I can't imagine why you would do that, right? Who would want to be alone with their mind? I've heard that so many times. Like, yes. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that, they're really successfully avoiding it with that. Um, and like, of course, like there's a really great reason to not always be, right? Fully ensconced in what's difficult, what's hard, the things I don't want to look at in my life. But if we make absolutely no time for that, there's no way we can sit and meditate and really develop clarity, calmness, and, and be able to start transforming the mind and the heart. And, you know, I bring this up in the context of this book. He talks about it as, you know, our pain identity. And the simple way he describes our pain identity is when we start really constructing who we are around what we lack a feeling of needing more, wanting more. And that is, you know, the kind of classic cycle of the mind of hope and fear. And that, how that just chases one tail to, towards another, like, God, I really hope this thing will happen. I'll be okay if this thing happens. And I really don't want this other thing to happen. And I won't be okay if it does. And that can kind of keep our mind busy nonstop. Mm -hmm. And we'll never actually experience our own mind. And that might mean we don't experience some of the depth of things we're trying to avoid feeling. But there's a lot of them. We'll get into that a little bit more. But for the purposes of this practice, one of my favorite practices, uh, I learned it from Alan Wallace, who's one of my root teachers. And when I was in the most difficult period of my life so far, <laughs> so far or actually honestly it was the most difficult period and the earliest in my practice right so I was still maybe only four or five years into practice so it was 
I didn't have, I didn't realize or have a lot of ability to be with the kind of pain I was in. Physical pain, emotional pain, the whole thing at that moment. And I remembered this practice that he had taught and I listened to it on repeat every single day, like pretty much nonstop for a week or two. I was recovering from a surgery, so there wasn't a lot of things to do. And it really made an imprint on me. So I feel very honored and lucky to get to share it with you all. And the premise of the practice, you know, with all compassion practices, the intention is alleviating suffering by recognizing and really feeling the quivering of the heart, the heart that cares for suffering. We can do this for others, of course, but for ourselves, it's being able to actually look at ourselves and recognize what is our suffering. And in this practice, it's a very specific level of recognizing the suffering that we create on top of the pain that's already there. So this idea sometimes that there's, you know, pain is necessary and suffering is is optional. You'll hear that sometimes. Meaning pain, you know, having surgery, at that time having uh, other forms of loss emotionally, that's painful. Like no one, no one could say that wasn't painful. But the suffering was, why is this happening to me? Why doesn't this happen to other people? What's wrong with it? It'll always be this way. So that's the like layer or level of mental suffering that we add to our pain. And to have compassion for that, to have compassion for that feeling. There's a seat up here if you want. That is, that's a really interesting one. And so before we practice, I want to make sure that folks really have a sense of, is there an example in your life now or in your past when you have added suffering to your pain? I see a smile and a nod from Rao. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Does that sound, is there, are anyone willing to share a couple so we can not only recognize it in ourselves, but recognize the universality of this for all of us? Anyone have an example you're willing to share? That one's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Closing their eyes and looking away. Mace? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so fun to see all the people here um all the time like i'll do something because i have a big giant enormous mouth that likes to share <laughs> a lot of information um and i'll say things or do things that are like sort of you know probably inappropriate not overly professional and i'll then like recognize that i did that and then i spend a lot of time just beating the shit out of myself right. and saying like, oh, like the way I speak to myself, if anyone spoke to me that way, yeah, they would not be hanging out with me. Yeah. But I hang out with me all the time. So like, that's just like a, a regular. Yeah. Second, third, fourth, fifth arrow. Exactly. Experience that I have. Yes. Thanks yep. for bringing up the arrows. Yeah. So some folks may be familiar with this um, kind of apocryphal teaching around the second arrow, which is that additional suffering. So in when we were going through the biography of the Buddha, I can't remember what where it came along in the suttas, but you know, this description that the Buddha gives over specifically how we can start reducing suffering, mental suffering. And he says, if you were shot with an arrow, then considering like how is it that this arrow happened? Like, why, why did I get shot? Is like shooting yourself with another arrow instead of going to the doctor and getting treatment. Okay. So that, you know, that's the way. And this idea of like all these second arrows is the second, secondary or third um, ways that we apply this kind of ruminative quality to our experience. And, and what Mace is also describing is how shame shows up, right? how in, in addition to something that's painful or hard, we then can like really spiral there. And I think evolutionarily, there's probably a good reason we're so good at ruminating. I know I've mentioned this before, but rumination is a term that's used also for cattle, the way they chew. Huh. We're like chewing on it, chewing on it, chewing on it. And in our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, if something scary or bad happened, we'd go home and chew on it so that we don't make like have that happen another day, right? Like it made sense to really work with it. And now a lot of our material that's like difficult 
is self-related, right? Foibles. And, you know, I do think it's kind of fair to say that we are, many of us, like addicted to ourselves, right? And to this thought pattern that is self-referential. And it'd be one thing if it was grandiose, it's kind of annoying to be around. But for most of us, it's like, like May said, not very nice. Like it's habitual, it's compulsive, and it's painful. And to really kind of see that soberly is the only way that we actually start to unwind it. We don't see it. It doesn't matter how much meditation practice or yoga or qigong or good tea we apply, right? Where we have to kind of see and loosen that compulsive, super painful way that we're often replaying uh, and and shooting more arrows at what's already difficult. Yes. Is this like? Um... Oh, thank you. So a lot of times when we suffer, it's by choice, and we replay. You know, like why did this happen to me? Would it be the same thing if it's something that we experience a trauma, not by choice? Yeah. And it's kind of like a loop or like, say, PTSD or something like yeah. that. Yeah. It is still this, will that suffering still be the same? It's, I mean, it's a, it's a great analogy. And I think the way, you know, the way our mind works is on a continuum, not like this is a trauma and that isn't, right? There is the continuum of things that are emotionally distressing and difficult, but with trauma, it's a lot harder to redirect, right? And when we are not engaging in that, you know, kind of self-critical practice, I'm doing the like, you know, when the guys go around whipping themselves on the back, right? Self-castigation. Um, when, when we're not doing that for something, we just blurt it out. That requires a level of meta-awareness, like, whoa, I'm beating myself up. I got to stop. But when we're in the loop, when we have those uh, in, invasive, uninvited imagery from trauma, it's a lot harder to get the space to do the reappraisal. Like it's a lot harder to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, it's not impossible and it is something learned over time, but it is, you know, it is like adding extra suffering, but I don't want it to sound, um, blameworthy, right? Like, oh, people experiencing PTSD, they're just choosing suffering, mm -hmm. right? And nor is it really within our control, like this, this rumination, it's happening in the background. Mm -hmm. And we're often not aware of it. It's really funny because Rinpoche loves using uh, the metaphor of like computers and phones, which I, I find funny. So he's like, you have so many tabs open on your internet browser <laughs> and you don't even know what they are and they're draining you, you know? So, you know, it's just this idea of like what's draining us and often what's draining us is these background thoughts that are, you know, and so until we bring them out, which is a little scary, it is hard to be with them and release them. Yeah, good question. Anyone else willing to share like a way you contribute, you add those areas? Yes, Isaac. Thanks. So late last year, I broke my wrist, mm -hmm. which some people may remember when yeah. I had a cast. Yeah. And uh, I was up to no good one evening while with a broken wrist and thought I injured it more. And then for like a week until my next x-ray, I was like so upset with myself. Mm -hmm. So I was like, mm -hmm. why'd you get drunk and <laughs> <laughs> lean on your wrist and so on. Yeah. And of course I get to the x-ray and the guy's like, oh, it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, what? Because I, I, it, it hurt so much when I leaned on it. I was convinced that yeah. it must have been rebroken or something. Yeah. So it was like a week of needless uh, sadness. Yes. Right? But it was, yeah, but such an instructive way to see how unkind we can be to ourselves. Right. You know, and then so rarely do we get the, you know, you know, the instant he said that, I, did it all go away? Like, was it like? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't actually done it, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And so it's how do we then like self-liberate those feelings of like, I did it wrong. I'm wrong. I'm doing it wrong. Especially those old ones that have been hanging out for like decades that we're not even totally aware of, but they're kind of running in the background. 
extra hard to, you did it wrong, you're not doing it right, other people are doing it better. Like those can really be added and they kind of rise up. Like I'm, I'm curious if there's ever been another experience where that same narrative came in of like, I can't believe it, you're careless or whatever. No, I mean, yeah, constantly probably, but that's a recent and tame example. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we get those moments, right? And so I think what this practice is for is, can we be compassionate to that way that we look harsh on ourselves, that we like contribute and add that extra pain? Does, does that make sense to folks? Does anybody not have an example they can remember when they've added more difficulty or pain to their experience? Something to work with? Yeah? Are you excited? <laughs> yes. I just think it's interesting the last two comments kind of pointed out that some of these things are and you also mentioned like the history that it's also not just us that these come from these narratives are yeah. become and so depending on who you are in this world it might be more um trained in a way yeah. and I was thinking about just being a woman in this world and kind of being like sorry for taking up space you know, and then being like, oh, that's that apology. Yes. I'm putting this on me, but it's kind of been put on me. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That conditioning is really strong. Um, and I think for this one, you know, the way that Alan has taught it is to really think of one time we can really remember making ourselves miserable. So Isaac's example is perfect. Like just how much we added to it and then finding compassion right there. So we'll do this as a bit of a shorter practice since we're going to do another practice tonight. But go ahead and find a posture that supports you. Please, yeah. And for folks in the room, taking a moment and really just feeling the sense of being in the space together. For some folks, this is naturally easeful for other folks this may be new and less so so really getting a sense of being held by these walls this floor we got mace in the front really helping us feel safe here and for friends online really getting a sense of safety and comfort in your own home And giving yourself a moment to wherever you're in contact with the ground or the earth, really almost letting it massage you a bit. So lifting the feet a little or touching the ground if you're close to it. And if it feels comfortable, allowing the eyes to be gently closed or softly focused in front of you. And before we turn our full gaze and attention inward, giving ourselves even more of a sense of place and space by considering and imagining the night sky above us. Imagining the beauty of this land both built upon and the land as it existed for millennia before we were here. And feeling ourselves here in this very beautiful, unique day before a leap day, right in the end of February, feeling that sense of springtime all around. And then orienting completely inward, as though we shifted that attention and awareness of our surroundings and inverted it fully to our own sensations and feelings.
And of course, the mind is busy, has plans and memories, worries and fantasies. But really consider the value of giving your mind this refreshment and nourishment to be fully here in the body. This is actually what it's likely seeking, a sense of safety and care. So feel and imagine the quality of stillness in the body. A couple more moments here, just feeling and imagining a quality of stillness in the body, which means experiencing everything that exists within the stillness of the body, the subtle movements and undulations of energy, the aliveness of the body. And then choosing to rest in the form of stillness not going anywhere, not needing anything. A stillness that feels like fullness. Inviting the speech, the inner narration to calm and find its way to a natural state of silence by following the breath. Specifically, noticing the subtle sensations of breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. Breathing in, the breath is a bit cooler and breathing out a bit warmer. Of course, there can be many sounds as we preference silence. And each time we get carried away by sound, we can notice what it's like to return, focusing on the subtleness of breath.
one more phase and stage of this in initial settling in is inviting a sense of spaciousness and warmth through the heart and the mind. Still feeling that stability and fullness of having the body in stillness. Feeling the opportunity of silence. And then the natural blossoming of this warmth and spaciousness. As we settle the body, speech, and mind in their natural states, there's an opportunity for even one breath to feel the fullness of presence of what it's like to inhabit this possibility of stillness and silence, openness and warmth. as we shift into our practice of compassion, notice the simple kindness and care that has brought you here tonight. In some sense of desire for transformation, for clarity, resilience, and feel the goodness of that, that want you could almost feel that at the heart, like a area of light, a feeling of warmth and care. And sensing this pilot light of compassion, always lit, always illuminating the heart. And for a couple moments, really feeling and imagining this warmth as a, a glowing light at the heart. Sometimes it gets a little occluded when we're busy, distracted, falling into self-criticism. But maybe there's a sense that this light is actually always already here. Not something that needs to be created, but actually the bare naked essence of our being. There's such a basic longing in this heart to be at ease, to be free, to alleviate suffering of ourself and others. And 
for a couple moments without any words or images, any discursive thinking, see if you can just feel the heart of compassion. Shifting our attention and awareness to imagination and memory. We're going to bring to mind this maybe recent or maybe in the past moment in which we added and contributed to our own suffering. Really feeling a time in which we might have felt completely wretched lost in shame or regret or frustration. Maybe it was directed as blame towards ourselves or someone else. And as we remember this, see if we can really recall how painful it was to experience, not focusing on what we should have or could have done differently. But the actual pain and feeling this intensity. This might feel tender. This might be hard to feel. Wherever you are, just taking a couple more moments that really attending to our own suffering, our own self-created, self-extended layer of suffering. And as though your heart had arms, really wrapping yourself in an embrace of love and care, compassion for this added mental suffering. Feel or imagine you could go back in time and create this embrace for yourself right when you needed it. And this could feel like love or light. Maybe there's a word or phrase, I love you, I'm with you, I got you. And a couple more breaths here, really feeling that strength of care, and that extension of the heart. And coming back to this body and breath, and noticing any shifts or changes in the body. Noticing areas of sensation, maybe tenderness or heat, areas of heaviness or movement. And feeling this body as a body of compassion. And for a couple breaths, inhaling slowly and then exhaling with the mouth just loose and open, so releasing.
And one more together, inhaling and release. And taking a moment to actually shift our gaze towards the future when inevitably there will be causes and conditions that once again lead us to creating mental suffering. Maybe something doesn't go our way, we feel unseen or heard, and we get caught up. Taking a moment and imagining sending compassion to our future self and all the ways we might need it. And so we could reach out through time and wrap ourselves in that embrace. And feeling the goodness of this care for our future self, the possibility of this compassion showing up for us right when we needed it. When invariably circumstances arise again, which were susceptible, more mental suffering, more rumination. And again, feeling the heart radiating towards this future self. Maybe there's words or phrases, maybe just a sense of care. And just a couple more breaths here. Releasing this image of ourself in the future, just resting in compassion here. Compassion for the parts of us that still are susceptible to rumination and criticism. The parts of ourselves that we maybe struggle to love and be with fully. And feel and imagine that this is just a simple part of being human. Learning how to love ourselves more and more freely and deeply. Feeling the tenderness of heart to know that each of us in this room and online, each of us on this planet struggles with this additional suffering sometimes. And then releasing all thoughts, images, just resting in spacious awareness.
Thank you for your practice. Love to hear from folks, anything they feel like sharing or any questions or reflections on that practice. Thank you. Do you mind using the mic? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, how do you define compassion and showing compassion? Mm. I mean, I read, I was, I'm reading a book on, on meditation and it gave me a definition, but I wanted to hear yeah. thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, and, but then I will ask you a question. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I love the simple definition of the heart's quivering in the face of compassion. Sorry, the heart's quivering in the face of suffering with a desire and motivation to help. Like, so, you know, but there's the two parts like if we don't feel the quivering, we won't really be motivated to help. And it isn't always that we do something with compassion, but it is that desire to, to help, right? When we're meditating, sitting with our eyes closed, what we're doing is not very uh, action oriented in the world. Yeah. But I would be curious if you're willing, like, were you able to feel something like compassion or yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when when you said, "Oh, imagine yourself in a, a suffering mode, and then try to give compassion to yeah. yourself," I, yeah. I I felt that. Yeah. And what does it feel like? Uh, de uh <laughs> definitely like a sense of like understanding, mm. or, or like on a, like I feel the pain that you're feeling. Yeah. And. uh Sympathy, empathy, those yeah. things combined. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, is there rumination that is not adding suffering to pain? Is there a rumination in which you're not like it's productive or not helpful. Yeah. Like it's all rumination. Just well, what's your hit? I'll tell you my hit. What do you think? I just like many times there. I my mind was wandering, and in the moments where I was able to see that and reflect on it, I didn't. I wasn't able. Always able to go particularly deep, but it always yeah. seemed like the root or beneath. Some of that was something probably painful. Yeah. And like, why am I stuck there? Yes. And so, so that's where the question comes. Yeah. From. It seems pretty consistent. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. Kind of like, why do we ruminate? Huh. And there's quite a lot of good investigation to that question, and and often it's under the bigger. Um, rubric of kind of like mind wandering, you know, and um, there is very creative mind wandering. I know we have some artists and creators and everyone here is an artist and a creator. I shouldn't say there's some, some who do that professionally in this room. And often the spark of inspiration isn't like, I'm going to sit down and make a list of the painting I'm going to make, right? It's, it's this kind of diffuse, um, mind wandering that could be circular and moving. And then, you know, um, I, God, I had the unbelievable pleasure of seeing our poet laureate Ada Lamone last week. Anybody know? I highly recommend her poetry, but there's a reason I'm bringing it up. She says that poetry is a way to follow the natural rhythm of how thoughts flow. Like when we write, we're like, this happened, that happened, and then this happened. But our thoughts are more like, you know, like they're all over. And some of that can be super generative and super interesting. When I think of rumination and it's more like negative, 
uh, it's often stuck in one trough. You know, it doesn't have that wandery feel. It's like, and I think your insight on what am I not trying to feel is interesting. And I know for myself on retreat, when you have even more time to meet with your rumination, you know, and there's like nothing you actually like need to ruminate about, like all your needs are taken care of. So then you get to really see like raw rumination doing its thing. I really identified most of my rumination was about planning. Anybody else? And that that planning is actually wanting to be safe. I want to make sure that I can be safe and okay in the future. Irrespective of the fact that like right now, safe and okay, like sitting on a meditation cushion, <laughs> like, you know, but still it's like that. But what if I'm not safe in the future? And I think we have to be clear on like, exactly as you're describing, what don't I want to feel? and apply compassion there, even if it's kind of diffuse, even if we're not exactly sure, all I know is I keep ruminating on this thing, I don't even exactly know why, but can I have compassion for that part of me that's ruminating and that feels like I need to, like that compulsion. And it is, it's rough, it's so interesting. I don't know if you've all had this experience, but that when I really, this weekend with the full moon and doing some practice around that, I really felt this clarity of like, wow, self-critical thinking is an addiction. If we just look at what addiction is, right? And and often our addictions serve the purpose of avoiding something else. But what I also saw so clearly is that self-critical rumination is so self-absorbed. And I'm not available for anybody when I'm caught in that cycle. Um, so it's, it's like, we have to figure out, not only do we want to be free from the pain, like self-criticism doesn't feel good, <laughs> we do it, but it happens a lot. But then for me, the, the, the inspiration to get free is like how it affects others. Cause there's a lot of things like Mace was saying, she would not hang out with anyone who talked to her the way she talks to herself. So then what's our inspiration to like cut through that? So thank you. Other questions, reflections? Um, something came up um, in conversation with uh, some friends the other night over for dinner, and I'm not on social media, so I'm like years behind anything that's like mind blowing. Um, but they were sharing that there was some research done that some people don't think in words. And I lost my mind. I was like, wait, not everyone hears like that constant dialogue mm -hmm. or that constant, like um, that constant, like barrage of self-harm. And then I was like talking with one of my friends and she's like, well, I actually don't hear. She's like, I hear sounds and I hear tones, but I don't hear words. And then I was like, oh my God, you can't even think right. You know, like if you could choose a way to think, and I'm like, Melinda Love, you don't get to choose that, right? Yeah. That's how our brains work. But um, so that was really fascinating to me. And I've been thinking a lot about that mm -hmm. as a teacher too, because the way that I'm always talking with my students, I'm like, like imagine the character's voice in your head when you're talking. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, some people can't hear a voice or, mm -hmm. um, or like we talk a lot, I talk a lot about them with like the critical critter. So they'll name their their voice or their negative self thoughts. So critical um, critter. Yeah. So they'll like give it a name and then talk to it and be like, not right now, blue blue, you know. Um, so thank you. You know, like it's that is a really powerful force for all of us. Um, and my friend was like, well, even though I might not hear words, I still think in feelings. It's not that I'm not like harming myself with my thinking it just yeah. isn't coming in words like it's coming in feelings so that was kind of mind-blowing for me mm. um and then um sort of a second thing i'm sorry i'm talking so much but last night um my dad's wife passed and i was not close with her um but she really did help my um, father through his end of life. Um, mm. So I have so much appreciation for her. But the thought that came up for me was like remembering being back with him when he was in home hospice. Mm. Um, and he had let me borrow 
uh, his truck and I had gone to visit my aunt and I had these groceries and the key and it was like snowy and icy. And somehow between the walk to the house, to the car, I lost the key. And I was like searching for the key for like 20 minutes and losing my mind. And just like in that, you know, I had no, I'm like, I don't lose things. Like I'm really in control. And like, so there was all of these feelings that I had and then I had to borrow my aunt's car and then my dad and his suffering, like he was bringing up all the suffering. So, and then just like, that was 20 years ago. And I can mm -hmm. see all of that. I can hear all of those words. Yeah. So it's kind of just interesting, the power of, um, the power of that. Yeah. Um, and then just to put on the layer of like compassion mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, wow, that was really hard, love. Yeah. That was really, really hard. So, yeah. um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I do think, you know, again, there's very good evidence to support this idea that we can heal the past. You know, we can't go back in a time machine, but by bringing forth these memories that still live in us, there is a possibility of like holding them in compassion. And that's really powerful. And that might be that the next time we, as we call it in the research world, like retrieve that memory, it has a different valence or a different feeling for us. That is awesome, right? Like rewriting, you know, through meditation, these painful times with that tenderness. It's a, a huge opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. I had a uh, experience like in uh, my earlier childhood and it's abandoned. And, um, you know, I was just, and I was remembering um, the rumination and which reverberated echoes to this day, sort of like it was my fault. Mm -hmm. It was something that I did. Mm -hmm. I drove him away. There was something. And looking back at that, I really felt like what I was avoiding feeling was just a sense of like mm -hmm. powerlessness. Right. Was that really just had nothing to do with me? But somehow that's even worse yeah. than thinking that, like almost like I think it was my fault. I could have controlled it, and it was sort of controllable. And the the other feeling is like entirely and that out of my control and that feels like it's so um i don't know it's like mm -hmm. meaninglessness and whatever mm -hmm. so it was really like um very kind of moving to try to project a sense of compassion to this poor suffering thing and realizing that what he's doing is just trying to yeah you know make things better by yeah. beating himself up you know so yeah so it just felt um yeah, really sad, I guess. Yeah, and be and beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's so interesting because, you know, of course, a lot of the these habits are early in, in our head that we st we interpret information like, you know, Vanessa was saying, from the world. And we're like, oh, that's about me. And then we, you know, solidify it. And then what you're pointing to is kind of the... It's this like, I feel like it's that, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's like this hesitation right before we release into emptiness, the groundlessness, when it's like, no, 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 no. Like really with grief, this happens, where we are avoiding the sorrow, we're avoiding the sorrow. We're like, oh God, no, God, it's gonna be so hard. And then we were bawling and then we're at peace. And then there's something there of like just not wanting to go towards yeah. that like bumpiness in, in the beginning, awesome. you know, and that, like, well, and that, yeah. yeah, and that there, but, you know, Chogyam Trumpa talks about this so much in, you know, the sacred heart of the warrior is not someone without fear. It's the willingness to meet fear. And he's very clear. He's like, your unwillingness to meet fear is the entire problem. That's it. It's between you and awakening. If you can meet your fear, you're not gonna have any problems on the path to awakening. And I'm like, I kind of believe that, <laughs> right? Or like really getting clear on what we're afraid of. And often we're like afraid of the fear. It's like this interesting karmic knot, right? We don't wanna feel the fear. And then all these compensatory behaviors on top of it or desires to control or change. I think I see Claudia. Very patient. Nice to see you. Yeah, likewise. Steve, how are you doing? Good. Good. I have um, several questions. Um, one is like to clarify what you just said and see if I understood correctly. 
Um, about two weeks ago, I went through a lot of suffering and a lot of rumination that was partly rooted, or a lot of it rooted, on past trauma. Mm. And of course, I, you know, I had all this rumination and these feelings that I was feeling bad about feeling them, but yet I couldn't avoid having them. And I was trying to work through them in my body and all this. But you just said something about, I mean, and our whole practice tonight was about having compassion towards that rumination. And I'm, if I understood correctly, are you saying that if we have compassion we practice on having compassion on that rumination is that a way to heal the trauma hmm it's a great question and i'm sorry to hear it claudia that it's been a hard couple weeks or that it was hard a couple weeks back um, it can be really challenging to get kicked up especially the old wounds you know mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. to meet them in our practice um i don't think in the moment I think in the there's two different things in the moment, right? If we are experiencing uh, some sort of intense rumination and difficulty, we can probably have like a yeah, hand on the heart, hand on the belly, or breathe and just be like, "I love you. I'm here. It's okay." Mm -hmm. We're doing these practices where we're actually kind of going back in time and retrieving this older memory mm -hmm. that may end up shifting. Like what we know about memory, which is so fascinating, memory research, a lot of our memories are actually very influenced by how we feel right now in the present. Mm -hmm. um, and that our accuracy of our past memories is like very n not good. Um, and so this idea of like how we read, you know, the memories that we're always bringing forward and bringing forward, we're usually re-encoding them right with our telling of them in this present time so if we re-encode them with i love you i'm here for you i care about you it's just a hypothesis but i feel pretty strong from my own practice doing this that it mm -hmm. it works right and i think there is a real power to that and i would love to see a randomized control trial of it but <laughs> i think better to just try it and and see you know can we work with and we we end up doing that anyway right like hmm. we get our heart broken it feels horrible over time you know maybe the first months or years it's like so painful and hard and you know there's all this rumination and then a memory arises of that heartbreak we're like oh it's okay i was sharing earlier um with tara that's interesting you know i grew up in the city so many layers and levels of like the blocks. I grew up in the neighborhood I live in. So it's like, like so many layers on like every street corner. And I get these little reminders of like, oh, remember when you're on this corner and you were miserable. <laughs> and now like you're not, right? And you get to see that sh and they can bring forth those memories and be like, God, that was a hard moment or that was a hard time. And, just that way that we can like really, yeah, kind of like wrap ourselves in our own love. You know, that same idea with Shanti Deva of you can't wrap the world in leather. So it, in order to avoid the spiky, painful parts, but you can wrap your mind, mm -hmm. right? You know, or he says, wrap your feet in leather so you right. can walk all over it. We can wrap our mind in that compassion so that everything we meet is not so spiky. And that includes thoughts that just arise unbidden in our head. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. practice that. And I have another question, uh, Eve. Tonight I had a real hard time um, uh, meditating, partly because my stomach has not been feeling that great. It was tender, and my body felt incredibly, especially my legs, incredibly restless. So I was mm. trying to be still in my body, but I couldn't. I mean, it was just so hard. So do you have any recommendations for that? I mean, when that happens, I mean, I did exercise today, you know, I went swimming and blah, blah, blah. So it's not like I haven't been moving, but yeah, like I was just down. so restless. Hmm? Lying down? Like yes, I was, lying. I was lying down. Yeah. You were lying down. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think, especially if the belly's unhappy, 
Mm -hmm. really hard. We live in our bellies. Like it's very hard, you know? And so if there's any way to be comfortable, which could be lying down, it could be in child's pose. Like it doesn't really, posture doesn't matter if, if the body can feel more comfortable. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think that could even be like, you know, some kind of warmth on the belly um, and just wherever the distraction to the belly arises, bring compassion there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Good to see you. You too. The, the memory thing is so significant because when I wind up in that state of I've overworked, I'm now exhausted mm -hmm. and uniquely anxious. And I find myself telling myself, you are such an exhausted, nervous wreck. Mm -hmm. And then I check my memory mm -hmm. and it's like, you are predominantly a very uh, stable person who enjoys themselves <laughs> and it is only occasionally that you are an exhausted nervous wreck and i know that this works because i have become much better hmm. at catching that yeah. and rebalancing yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And that, you know, that again, that's a reframing when we're in that rumination. And I, I do want to disentangle here. Rumination very often is about the future. And obviously memories are about the past. So there's like a little variability. Like some of our rumination can be about that past bad thing. A lot of our rumination is like this thing that hasn't yet happened that we're worried about. So that goes both directions. And that's interesting in that practice where we imagine our future selves, like that's going to happen, right? We're going to be there again. There's something so, I feel like so generous to imagine to that future time where we could actually show up for ourselves with love and care. It feels, yeah, it's a different quality. But anyway, just to mention that rumination can be past as well as future so I would love to talk about water a little bit, but I, are there any other, we absolutely have time if there's another question or comment on that practice. Okay, folks online, good. Thanks Denise for hosting. Okay, all right. So yeah, I think, I bring up the kind of invitation and opportunity to, to see ourselves so clearly. Because in the book, you know, Rinpoche in like the very first and second chapter, he really emphasizes that we are not going to be able to retrieve from these elements unless we know what we're missing, right? We can't actually ask for the ground of earth if we don't realize we're ungrounded. Like we have to know like, where are the places that we're struggling? What is it we're actually needing the support of? And, you know, I think that which is something we're trying to avoid, the feelings, they're not really that unique and inspiring. Like generally deficiency, heartbreak, insecurity, right? Like, does anyone have anything more original than those? Mm -hmm. The core feelings you're trying to not feel like that's it, right? <clears throat> like some flavor of that. But a lot of the things that we do to avoid feeling it, that's where we start like calcifying our pain identity, like searching outward, doing things that like get us farther and farther away from just being and sitting with that difficult feeling for a little while. Because it, it, it passes, right? When we hang out with that fear, that heartbreak, it doesn't stay. It's not consistent. It's not solid. It, it will shift and move. And with water, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really sweet one. I mentioned this last week. It's not necessarily the quality of water like the ocean. It's not that kind of movement. I'm going to read a little how he describes it here. He said, water offers a sense of comfort, 
the water element is balanced in you. When the water element is balanced in you, you're comfortable in your body and in your environment, comfortable at work and with your family, you're fluid, able to respond with ease to changing circumstances. Put simply, you enjoy life. In its higher dimension, a healthy connection with water brings innate joy of being, a joy not dependent on whom you're with, what job you have, how much money you make, or other external circumstances. When it's not balanced, you may feel ill at ease. Something feels off or not quite right. You can't get comfortable with yourself, your relationships, your job, your connection to nature. You lack well-being. Imagine hearing a gentle rain or feeling a flow of warm water over your body. Take a moment and experience the comfort and ease of water. Do you tend to feel peace, content, and comfortable with yourself in the world? Or are those feelings missing in your life? If they're missing, in what circumstances do you experience that lack? How long have you experienced the discomfort in your life? Is it a long-standing pattern? And so, I mean, I do feel a lot of these elements overlap, right? So the sense of ill at ease and kind of lacking joy and well-being seems to be throughout all of these. But the one that seems kind of, to me, that sticks out with water is really this idea of like comfortable, able to flow with the changes. So much more like the river. I heard this beautiful teacher talk about how most of us are often trying to figure things out and get things done. And he said, don't push the river. <laughs> I really love that. I'm like, right, river is going to do its river thing. Don't push the river. So when we are balanced in that water element, what we're seeking or what we're asking for is this sense of ease, the sense of relaxation that is allowing us to kind of move with life as it is, calm and flowing and cleansed. And, you know, again, I think for many of us who spend time in the ocean, this is not that kind of water experience, not easeful. It's like kind of scary sometimes and exciting. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's the difference between you kids who grew up in San Francisco. Or <laughs> you don't know it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> It's just a scary fun. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the I mean, I yeah. In right. The water's warm. Right. Gentle. Yeah. It's very. It's this very abiding yes. kind of feeling. Yeah. You feel very, very comfortable in that sort of setting. Yes. That being said. I lived in San Francisco for 36 years surfing here, and it's a different deal. Yeah. You know, it's a totally, so yeah, you are right. <laughs> but then there is this other there, ocean. There is that other thing. So when you bring to mind retrieving from water, you can imagine SoCal. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can do that. and then for, for others of us, if like, you know, trying to think of like, where is that water that we feel at ease? And it really could be warm water in the shower, you know, like that is a very easeful feeling. It's extremely relaxing. Um, there could be, you know, a time in which we felt we did have space by a river or by a lake. You know, it's so often cold here that that might not be a warm feeling, but maybe, you know, maybe it's still enjoyable. Like in the Sierras, you can really see the beauty of the rivers. And um, so, yeah, just really connecting to that, like wherever that water essence is and where we can find it. And again, here there there is, you know, some, mm -hmm, it's a little icky, the water in Golden Gate Park. I'm all, like wanting to recommend it. I'm like, oh, it's a lot of duck poop. But uh, yeah, I think warm showers is a definite uh, possibility or a tub, right? Um, for folks. Yeah, Kabuki Springs. Yeah. So is the prescription to be like immersed in the water, like submerged in the water? Or can it also be like sitting by a yeah. body of water and just like walking in water? Absolutely sitting by it. Okay. Yeah. And that, and again, especially next couple of days, there's a big storm at the beach. So that might not be the most calming. 
but many days it is like very still easeful. And, and as Jorge was saying, like sitting by the beach, people feel at ease, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, the bay, bay is calm, right? The bay is very calm. Heron's head, right? Mace, sometimes, yeah, they'll just... Smart. Aquatic park, like where are the areas you can kind of have that sense of like that fluidity and calling upon it. Um, so we only have a minute or two, but I'd still like us to take a moment and kind of imagine or feel call upon that quality of water. Then we can have our water-based homework. And taking a moment and just feeling and sensing in the body. Whatever is here, bless you. And especially noticing and feeling, are there areas in your life where you could really use the sense of comfort, the sense of ability to be with whatever is here? whatever obstacles or challenges are here. I'm feeling that desire to feel comfort, that desire to feel the fluidity. And then bringing to mind and imagining this quality of being by the water, being in the water. There might be an immediate hit in the body. Fluidity and ease and comfort. We're feeling and imagining just the, the essence of that quality and what it feels like, and what it shows us in our own experience. And feeling and imagining that quality of fluidity and ease that natural comfort and inviting that to really live within us to feel that fluidity. Inviting that essence right here, right now, this body and this breath. The difference between rumination be like a dam stopping up a river and inviting instead this quality of pushing through and flowing, changing. And if there's any presence of that quality of fluidity, just allowing ourselves to really feel its nourishment.
Anybody feel the fluidity? It's like kind of, I don't want to say for everybody, but kind of easy to imagine and feel. It's interesting. Like it is a quality that can just kind of be called upon. And it is, I hadn't thought about it, but it really does feel like the opposite of rumination, you know, like really different quality. So that might be an interesting one to play with. If we are able to catch ourselves in the rumination, we invite that quality, that essence of water, feeling and imagining it here. And, you know, for those of you who keep an altar at home, it can be really nice to start having like a rock right, that you're practicing with and uh, very traditional to do water offerings in certain forms of Tibetan Buddhism. So you could have just a little bit of water just as reminders. It's really nice to bring these essences in their tangible and tactile form into our practice. Um, so we're going to dedicate the merit and then have a couple announcements. So but any any questions on that practice? We'll do it again. Yeah. That is. Oh yeah. The imagery or the experience I brought up to my mind is always very relevant maybe for to my mother. Like mm -hmm. my mother would always bring me a bottle of earth when I travel abroad to make me grounded and mm -hmm. like today about water I remember in high school I had a panic attack for my mm -hmm. math exam because I thought I couldn't do it and she gave me a warm bath wow. and that works better than any therapist mm -hmm. but, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but in my mind it's more like I can connect to the support I can connect to the fluidity but yeah. The other layer is always to this person who provide me with the yeah. safety. Yeah. Does it, should I orient in either way or? I, I, I don't see it as a problem at all. It's beautiful. And I think um, we'll do this in announcements in a moment, but because we do have an opportunity to talk with Wangel Rinpoche about this book in three weeks, it would be a really beautiful question for him, you know, I think, cause I think that's, you know, I couldn't say according to him, to me, that sounds like it's not a, what I would be looking for is it is, is it a distraction or an obstacle? It doesn't feel like either. Right. So, yeah. And it is the great mother. Right. So. The instructions in his own attention. Right. To feel the ease of that gift of your mother's love. That's right. Your mother yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely in the compassion. Yeah. And in the natural essences, you know. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's take a moment. Once again, returning our gaze and attention inward. And really feeling the presence of our shared space tonight and considering the possibility that some of our time and attention here may be generating some benefit. We use this word merit just as a, a way to symbolize that what we do here has a benefit. And if it's comfortable placing hands together in front of the heart as an offering, and we dedicate any of that merit, any of that shared energy. We dedicate it out for all beings, all the beings who are in need of shelter and safety, all the beings who need love and belonging. So that each and every being would know freedom, peace and ease. Thank you all for your practice. Um, a couple, so next week I will be surfing in Mexico. 
<laughs> for my birthday. Thank you. And uh, we will have, some of you have met Jenny Trebell before. She's a teacher who is often with Lama Soltrim when she's in town. And she is a Feeding Your Demons certified teacher. And she's going to do it live here next week. No, so that will be pretty excellent. If you haven't done feeding your demons, it's a really interesting practice. It's a structured practice based on um, the Vajrayana severance or cutting through to practice in which you really, as we talked about tonight, meet and face some of the difficult things in your life, personifying them, imagining them, transforming them into your ally. So feeding your demons means when you kind of bow to and open to what's difficult, you may find the wisdom quality that's already there. Super powerful practice. Anyone in this room done it? What do we say? Pretty good, highly recommend. Uh, we have a half day, March 16th, that I'll be leading here. We're just gonna meditate our butts off again. And there's some other stuff happening. Anything? Mm -hmm. I should mention. I okay. Thanks, Mace. Nothing. Uh... Hi, friends. Can we just take a little moment and beam Eve some birthday love? Oh. Yeah. I just, I wasn't sure you were going to say it was your birthday, but I had it written down. Um, so yeah, really sweet. Um, one announcement is that if you go outside and you look at the center from that direction, so cool. There's a there's a glowing lotus. So you should all check it out. And then um Daniel's gonna make an announcement in a in a minute, but uh there's a couple things in the schedule next week. So check it out. So like we have Jenny coming to do feeding demons, and then there's the last trauma informed Satipatana stuff with um on Ama Tanasati. And then Nature of Mind, new on Thursdays, mm -hmm. and yeah, awesome. with online. So check it out. And then yeah. there's a couple things. And then we're just like highlighting right now that if people don't know, there is Recovery Dharma here every Friday and Sunday. And that is, I don't know if you could call it a complete, it, it's, it's a recovery path that isn't, christian god based like 12 step not that you have to have a christian god in 12 step i'm but the word god in capital g appears many times mm -hmm. in the 12 step canon so um this is an alternative so folks can know that and then of course we run on the generosity um the financial contributions of folks and we have multiple ways to take that up front so come check it out mm -hmm. volunteer opportunities and more birthday love for 